In failing, everything you do is personal choice. The only thing you haven't got a choice to do is really the quarry. That's always going to be, in this particular area, is going to be Grey Lake or Pink Feet. So be aware of any other geese. Sometimes you get Barney's flying around. You have to be aware of that. Everything else over in the quarry is personal choice. My choice, and my son's, and my first, have true with Ben, is multi layers of thin stuff. Thermals with thermals, something like this on top, and then over the top of that, a complete woolly bear. Nothing's more important than being really warm. If you're out there and you're cold, you're miserable. So you've got to be well prepared, you've got to get all the right gear, something that suits you. It doesn't always suit you, sir. It doesn't always suit everybody, but something you need. The other thing you must have is when you're out there on the marsh is subsidence. You must have something to eat, something to drink. So what we do is the old typical flask. Get ourselves a flask like that, nice chunky thing, doesn't matter if you drop it, if it goes in the creek, gets covered in mud, it doesn't matter. And because I'm organic, I have something else to eat, something like a penguin, something Mars bar, whatever you want to take. Take that out there with you, because you can be out there for three or four hours and you can be in temperatures much, much less than sort of zero. If you get wind chill factor as well, this time of year, early February, it's likely to be something like about minus five, the wind chill factor. So you want to keep yourself warm, it's the most important thing of all. Okay, let's make the flask. Just wait for the kettle to boil and see how we get on. Get your flask ready. Now, I don't normally have sugar, but when I'm out on the marsh, I always put sugar in my flask. Because, like I say before, a bit of chocolate, a bit of sugar, you're out there for four hours, it can get very cold. Be prepared. Nice flask of steaming coffee. shooting with someone like John Butler, you've got to make sure you've got all this sort of gear with you because he won't give you any sympathy at all. He certainly won't give you any of these tea. Right, get the flasks ready there. What I'm going to do now is get the guns out because the other important thing of course is guns and shooting. And guns again are a personal choice. Nobody can tell you what is the right gun or what is the wrong gun, what is the right cartridge or what is the wrong cartridge. The only thing that you need to remember is that you need a gun for the purpose. And the purpose on a marsh like this at Wigtown Bay, for us anyway, is shooting geese. So there's no point having a little pop gun. You've got to have something preferably that take three inch magnum cartridges. And wherever you stay, you will be booking up accommodation to stay. Make sure they've got a safe. Make sure they've got a gun safe. Because if they haven't got a gun safe, you're still breaking the law. Just because you're away from home, your guns are still going to be kept secure. The other thing that you'll find with guns, I'll get mine out first, is that being wildflowers, they get completely covered in crap. And what you need to do, if you can see my gun there, it was cleaned yesterday, you should clean your guns regularly, as often as you possibly can, because if you don't, they will be letting you down. Always, you would have done this when you left the marsh, make sure the magazines are empty. My gun is a three shot Winchester Magnum with five three inch cartridges, it's a, it's a good gun for killing geese. John, John Butler, he, as you probably already know, shoots with a 10 ball. Um, that's his choice, and it's probably the best choice for wild fowl. And if you can handle a 10 ball, that is. So you want to take your guns out of the safe. There's John's 10. There's my son Ben's 12. As you can see, they're all covered in severe crap, but they are completely clean, trust me and you must make sure they are clean. The other thing you need when you're out there is good head gear. You must have a nice warm head. Keeping your head warm, as you probably know, is one of the important things in keeping your whole body warm. You keep your head warm, let's say something like 80-90% of your body heat is lost through your head. So you want something nice and warm. They all take the mic out of me so I look like a, um, something out of the Second World War, but I don't care, I'm warm. The other thing that you need, this is again, there's a torch. The type of torch is entirely up to the individual. I wear this type of what, uh, torch, I'll put it around my neck like this, nice and easy to carry, not a problem at all, wouldn't notice that. And a personal choice for me is binoculars, because half the fun for me out on the marsh um, isn't just the sort of the shooting of the birds, but it's watching the birds, looking at the birds, 
And binoculars, especially for somebody who's a bit of a novice, is an absolute essential piece of kit to go out with somebody like John Butler who can actually then tell you and point out the different species to you. Through your binoculars, even if they're at a distance, they're well out of range, they're not going to be a problem for you as far as hiding is concerned, as far as being concealed from quarry is concerned, but are absolutely brilliant for people like John to say, over there Pete, there's, there's a white front, be careful of them, see how they're flying, listen to them, blah 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 and all the rest of it. These are barnies coming Pete, see them over there. Don't Look forget, free. sorry John. A good thing about barnies because as well, they sound like a load of yapping dogs and they're always going yep, 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 yep,
Or maybe we'll just go with them. Okay. So that's, that's my type of suit. That's what I prefer to wear. The other thing, the important thing is, again, is take a gun slip because um, it saves any problems. Even if you're only walking across the road, it's a public road and we want to keep the sport with a good reputation and else. We don't want to see people wandering up and down lanes with guns over their shoulders looking macho and all that sort of thing. So always have a gun slip. Don't go and buy an expensive gun slip for the marsh. Complete waste of money. It'll break your heart. You'll be concerned about it. In fact, you don't want anything out there on the marsh that you're going to be concerned about. You want something that you can be re relaxed with. You want something that will allow you to concentrate on what you're there for. And that's to look for quarry. Just look for the geese. So make sure you use a gun slip as well. Very important thing. Very, very critical piece of gear. You see that this is inside my shooting smock all the time. Is a compass. Doesn't matter how well you think you know the marsh. From time to time, you're going to get caught out. Yesterday morning, it's a typical example here. It was very, very misty. As it happens, it lifted, so it wasn't a hazard in any way. But I had a certain amount of comfort because I knew where I was all the time. I knew how to get back using the compass. It doesn't have to be an expensive compass. It's got to work, of course. No point going and buying a Mickey Mouse sort of two bob thing. You've got to make sure one that works. But you don't need to go and invest lots and lots of money. I and mean, you can buy these from an ordinary camping shop. Get them very, very reasonable. A few quid. You may not, hopefully, ever, ever use it. You may not ever use it. But for keeping it in your shooting smock, it's well worth doing. The other thing that you want to take with you as well is a whistle. The sort of recognised hazard whistle call, if, if, you're, if you've got a problem that everybody should know, is three sharp blows on a whistle. I won't do this now to demonstrate us. Hopefully you'd get half a dozen wildfowlers come running around wondering what was happening. But that is the recognised signal. Three whistles. Like Out on the marsh, people will know you're in problems. Years ago, um, it used to be free shots. People used to use free shots. But of course that got very confusing, especially when you're on a busy marsh like this, where you've got shots going off all over the place. You'd have had guys running everywhere thinking someone was in problems. So the whistle and a compass is essential, and the torch. The old famous torch. John's got his look. Oh, yeah, I've just been looking. Look, we can shine at each other. I put that on the inside pocket yesterday. There was a hole in that. It went all the way down. I just felt then it was inside the line. <laughs> what that look at you? It's even lucky if your flies ain't completely unbound. <laughs> 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 it was lucky, yeah. Well, you've got to have one. <coughs> You're yapping more this morning like a woman. <laughs> Did you have bloody stop? <laughs> all for a good purpose, John. All for a good purpose. Right, right I'm going to go in. Right, I'm going to get dressed up now then, and um, I'll see you when we get to the uh, to the gate where we're going to go onto the marsh. There's a gun here, but I don't know who that is. It's so much to do. by the marsh side now with John um, just doing our last minute checks just to make sure we've got anything one of the good things to do as a good practice is to actually get a list of all the things you like to take with you on the marsh get it typed out or handwritten out and get it laminated nice pocket size so you can keep that with you and after a little while you won't need it obviously but to begin with you can just look glance through it and just as a little reminder because the times that I've been out there and, and John have verified this the times we've both been out there and we've actually got there, you've walked for about 45 minutes or now and you got there and you thought, oh, bugger me, I've forgotten this. It might have been a pair of gloves, it may be something, which is just going to give it that little bit of added comfort. Um, so anyway, we've, we've gone through that checklist. I've gone through it in my head, John's gone through it in his head and whatnot, and we've double-checked everybody. It's a bit like being diving buddies. We make sure we've got each other's gear. Um, the other thing, the important thing, is a good stout stick. Because when you're walking out there, the terrain is 
it's absolutely awful and there's times when you can be having to wade across creeks and things if in doubt and I'll re-emphasize this if in doubt don't if you don't feel comfortable where you walk in and you feel that the stick is a bit soft don't go any further because you can lead yourself into deep trouble this particular marsh here and uh, the Merce is, is, is reasonably safe but still we shouldn't take any chances at all and nobody certainly should take any chances out of this remember if in doubt don't the old thing he who dares wins when you come to Wild Fowl there's a load of crap okay forget that bit he who dares wins rubbish if in doubt don't I'm just going to make sure that we put our permits in the window as well because the warden will be around in a minute and um, well, later on this morning she'll be checking it makes her job a lot easier if you follow all the rules for the local marsh that, that you're on and obviously you use all the correct access points don't go around upsetting any farmers while taking shortcuts and things use the right access points get to know the area before you actually start shooting talk to the local wardens or whatever or even local wildfowlers if you can and get to know the rules and regulations and comply with them and that's it so we'll see you again later on uh, out there on the marsh don't knock off yet can i just clarify something there when he said diving he doesn't mean muffed <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be. You're out on White Big Town Bay Marsh. Morning is breaking and it's the 14th of February. We're in a deep creek which we must be in because we're blo shooting below the, the high water mark of ordinary spring tides. This is what you must do in February. We are waiting for the first pink feet to come. And when they come, I shall tr attempt to call them to see if we can bring them within range. Right, that's it now for now. Person of the day, get in. <laughs> Yeah. It's two hanging about. Plus a single and going up to join. Yeah, they're coming, Ben. They're coming up the estuary, that's what we want.
These are coming dead low, Ben. Be ready to shoot, you know. Because the thing is, I don't want to shoot when you're not ready. And if they're bloody low enough... If you get a shot on them, so I'm shot them. Oh yeah, keep coming like that. These are low. There's about... There's two singlings in front of the bunch. And in the bunch is about 30. And they're coming dead low, straight towards us. Hey? Yeah. They're coming on as if they, they're at the height where they yeah, would look yeah. at, as if they would be interested in coming on the Merce. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Look how low they are then. Yeah. While they're coming, I'm, I'm going to try some of I did to our Chrissy the other day and it, we pulled them. Look at them coming then. Down. Yeah, I think we ought to. They, these, to me, are coming with the intentions of coming in on the Morris. Right? These are low, low, aren't they? They're coming to the mercy seat, then. You see? Yeah. Why are they coming? I'm not doing that. They're swinging over the Austria a bit now. You might be. I'm not worried about that. They're still low. Right now, ain't they? <coughs> two of them, two geese under the sun. They've gone off the marsh, don't it? Ben. Now, yes, if they all all week they have been coming like that, they've come straight on here. Yeah? A few. Yeah. Two. <coughs> Where Ben? I got them. They're not having it, are they? I'm going to take one if they come.
Right, we've actually finished the flight now this morning. It's been absolutely beautiful, wonderful. As you can see, if you have a look out there now, the Merth, it's an absolutely beautiful Merth. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. The geese have been great. You can see the sheep out there all grazing, really a tranquil sort of setting, looking really nice. I just want you to come and have a look at this way a little bit. See this creek here? When we came up here this morning, at um, six o'clock-ish, it's now three and a half hours later, this creek was empty, it was waitable. We've got over that. You've had it. Just to prove a point that these tranquil places cannot be as tranquil as they first appear, if we pan now and have a look at the tide, high tide line, you'll see there's a series of dead sheep. Now, those sheep, you'd believe, actually knew what they were doing and where they were going. But as you can see, they've been called out and they've paid the cost. And I can see from here at least half a dozen dead sheep on the high tide line, which have uh, unfortunately met there a lot and of course now this is what it's really all about is having a good time over here and now we can just see here comes Pinky Butler <laughs> here he comes you coming off then John <laughs> here he comes look he's knackered by the weight of it all <laughs> Carrying his, carrying his goose. <laughs> half, half of the course, Pinky Butler's fell over. <laughs> Lack of carrying his goose. <laughs> oh my god. In all seriousness, that's what it's about. Unfortunately, he's going to be in the larder, and I'm fortunate for him, but very fortunate for John there. Well, well done, mate. Round of applause for John. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bloody. I had to put a fall in, didn't I? Because <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> last flight won't be seeing Wigtown for another year but it's been a good one